In January, I wrote a column titled, Danielle Smith has an oil and gas marketing plan, not a climate plan. Well, yesterday, the Premier and the UCP government in Alberta launched a formal climate plan. But I'm afraid I was correct. It really is more of an oil and gas marketing plan. And to discuss uh, the uh, Emissions Reduction and Energy Development Plan, I'm going to talk to Simon Dyer, who is the executive Deputy Executive Director of the Pemba Institute. So welcome to the interview, Simon. Hello, Malcolm. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm... I, I don't know what to say here because this there's little that's new. There's almost nothing new in this document. There's 66 pages of it. It's comprehensive. There's lots of stuff in it, but nothing's new. And it's really a timid, tepid approach to climate policy, uh, out of step with the what we're seeing at the global level, up, out of step at what we're seeing at the provincial, at the at the national level here in Canada, and and even uh, compared to other provinces. Uh, I found it quite disappointing. Uh, that's my take on it. What's your take? Well, yeah, likewise, I think we were a little disappointed here. We were expecting a bit more in terms of a specific uh, climate plan that would actually act as a specific roadmap for Alberta in terms of reducing emissions and diversifying uh, Alberta's energy economy. I mean, uh, off the top, I guess there were a couple of noteworthy issues. I believe this is the first time where the government of Alberta has specifically um, stated, it talks about, about aspirational language, but stated in interest in a uh, Alberta goal to net zero emissions by 2050. So that is noteworthy. I mean, I, I should say that is mostly catching up with most of the uh, the world in terms of making these kinds of commitments. Of course, many, uh, many provinces, the federal government, the cities of Edmonton and Calgary, Many different industry associations have already made a commitment to net zero, so that was really uh, was was really catching up. But yeah, I mean, what was noteworthy was that, of course, you know, making a commitment to net zero now is is pretty mainstream. But the next question is, do you have a clear plan to get there? And uh, without any uh, twenty thirty uh, targets or short term uh, uh, commitments to reduce emissions, yeah, it's it's a description of you know the issues and uh, work uh, that has been done, but uh, not really a clear plan. Um, I think we should be very clear about the difference between an aspiration and a commitment, because there have been a number of oil and gas companies, banks, all sorts of comp corporations over the last couple of years, who instead of making a commitment to net zero by 2050, came out and said exactly what the Alberta government has done. Uh, we aspire to it, and they were harshly criticized. And if some corporations have even had shareholder, not shareholder revolts, but they've had you know criticism from shareholders because of an they aspire to as opposed to commit to. And I don't think we should mix those two up. This the Alberta government is only aspiring to, not committing to. And so I, I think that's an important distinction. Would you agree or disagree? Yeah, absolutely, and uh, and to get to net zero by twenty fifty needs, uh, you know, that's that's we have twenty seven years, and that means you know there need to be substantive milestones along the way, and uh, a, a, a aspiration around net zero without a clear short term targets or regulations that will at least get you on the pathway. Yeah, you're right. There's there's still significant work that needs to be done. Well, let's talk about the amount of work that needs to be done. Um, Canada released its national greenhouse gas inventory uh, that, that brings up the inventory updates it's to 2021. Uh, the, the, now we're at 690 megatons uh, per year of emission, greenhouse gas emissions. And Alberta, uh, with only 12% of the population, is far and away the biggest emitter, something like 37, 38% of the total. And primarily, you know, due to the fact that uh, it's home to most of the oil and gas production in Canada. So there is, and given the fact that the federal government has now been working for years on uh, on emissions reduction uh, targets, it has very clear uh, climate targets for 2030. I I I don't see how. I mean, I I said back in 2019 after the federal election that there. The road to emissions meeting Canada's climate targets runs through Alberta, and I don't I don't see how there won't be further cl political clashes between Alberta and Canada now that this plan is uh, is or non plan is on the table. 
Yeah, we absolutely need all jurisdictions in Canada to work together to reduce emissions, right? There was lots of uh, talk in the media and in the, the plan itself about uh, not setting random targets. There's nothing random about the climate emergency and the 190 countries have made specific commitments to reduce emissions by, by 2030. And absolutely, I mean, uh, Canada must reduce its emissions by 40 to 45 percent in the next seven years. And Alberta, as you said, 38 percent of Canada's emissions we are part of the problem, but we're also the biggest part of the solution. And uh, I didn't hear once uh, in the press conference yesterday or in the report that Alberta sees itself as a partner or commits to doing its 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 fair share of uh, moving this goal goal forward. It's 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 critical. We've got to all row in the same direction, and that's not happening yet. I think we should also take aim at some of the uh, the government's uh, literally fantasies around emissions reduction. Uh, one that stands out is, and this is, I'm reading from the, the uh, report, Alberta's ongoing legacy of emissions reduction policy leadership. Now, granted, uh, you know, Alberta came in with the, Canada's first carbon price in 2007, and it's done, it's, you know, it had the, the Nauta government brought in the climate leadership plan in 2015, which, which Jason Kenney promptly ripped up in 2019. Uh, so there's, there's the, you know, that. Uh, and that, then there's the idea that somehow uh, Alberta, the Canada is going to produce clean emissions free or low emission LNG, sell it to a Asian countries like China to displace coal in power plants, and somehow we're going to get carbon credits uh, back for that uh, under Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. And Premier Smith has said in a letter to, Justin, to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, that if we do enough of that, if we sell enough LNG, we could actually wipe out Canada's entire national inventory of greenhouse gas emissions. And that fantasy is in this document as well. And I've, I've talked to, I got on the record comments from Environment Minister uh, Stephen Gilbeau, Canada is not interested. That is not happening. And we should stop talking about it because it's a non-starter. And yet here it is again. And it just seems to me like this government is just completely out of touch with where the global energy transition is going and climate policy trends. Yeah, well, I mean, you, you raise a number of issues there. I mean, from the, I mean, the first one, absolutely. I mean, from the National Inventory Report uh, last week, since 2005, Alberta's emissions have increased more than any other jurisdiction uh, uh, in the country. So you can't be a, a climate leader if your emissions are increasing. So, I mean, that's, uh, that's that point uh, clearly. Absolutely. I mean, uh, an important part of a, of a climate and economic plan would be to reflect these uh, international trends under any kind of uh, net zero or uh, um, climate scenario where countries continue to make action on climate change. Uh, LNG demand and oil demand are set to decline. So, uh, you know, there is not a growing market for Alberta to uh, to participate in. And yeah, this uh, this issue around offsets around uh, LNG as it relates to uh, national emissions, uh, I agree. That's not how the international system uh, works, and Alberta should stop uh, should stop talking about it. It doesn't reflect well on Alberta as a serious player in this space. Uh, agreed. And there's another uh, a particular sector that really stood out for me, and that is electricity. So the general strategy amongst all countries uh, that are serious about uh, the clean energy transition uh, is we electrify everything. So we electrify transportation with electric vehicles and building uh, heating and cooling with heat pumps. And we decarbonize the power sector with wind and solar and storage and geothermal and hydro and, and on and on. So elect clean, low cost, reliable electricity is literally the foundation of the 21st century economy. And Alberta is perfectly situated for that. As Pembina well knows, it has the best wind and solar resources in the country. It has an open wholesale market where wind and solar developers can, can uh, tie, they have the right to tie into into the power grid and sell into Alberta's wholesale market. It leads in developing wind and, wind and solar. And there is literally, aside from the, the industrial emitter carbon price, which has been in place now since 2007, that that's about it. There is no, there's nothing in here about expanding the uh, renewable energy and clean energy. 
which needs to be doubled or tripled by 2050. It's just status quo. We'll let the system, you know, we'll let the market do what it does. Maybe we'll get there. Maybe we won't. And not even the United States is taking that 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 route. Uh, what do we make of that? Yeah, well, I mean, one of the one of the good things that in in the report is you know that the 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 section that sort of talks about some of the history in terms of some of the different um, things that Alberta has acted on over the past uh, twenty or thirty years. And one of the great success stories uh, is, of course, the the phase out of coal, which is uh, underway and uh, and ahead of uh, schedule based on you know specific uh, uh, policies implemented by uh, a previous government. So absolutely, that's uh, you know the. The cleaning of uh, Alberta's grid is a real success story, but we can go we can go much much further, and there certainly is a is a risk if that coal fired power is simply replaced with uh, with natural gas. We're going to have uh, stranded fossil fuel assets and uh, a less clean grid grid than we could have. I agree. I think you know although renewable energy is mentioned in the report, it really isn't given the the profile or the level of ambition in terms of what is actually possible as it relates to. Uh, uh, a net zero electricity supply. Of course, the federal government has made a commitment to have net zero uh, electricity grid across the country by 2035. And it again, this is another place where it would make sense for the government of Alberta to coordinate and be ambitious about uh, reducing emissions further from electricity. Well, speaking of lack of ambition, now let's give the UCP government their due. Uh, they have uh, done a reasonable job of, of building and promoting the hydro emerging hydrogen economy in Alberta. There's a hydrogen roadmap, uh, which I've read. It's very good. There's no comp problems there. Uh, they certainly have, uh, they've already put out an, a request for a proposal to build a hydrogen refueling system. Infra so building infrastructure in Alberta, which is very, very important on the supply side of things. And the Edmonton Regional Hydrogen Hub is kind of a model in Canada for how to how to coordinate and uh, strategize around building the building out hydrogen supply, but the government itself, in terms of its policies and and uh, and financial support, is really nowhere to be found. I mean, it's only one of many players uh, at, in the Edmonton Hub, and it really is not showing leadership, and it's not it's not pulling out its checkbook. Uh, like other governments are doing down in the U.S., uh, over in Europe, uh, in Asia, uh, they're all. It it there, it's the lack of leadership here, the lack of ambition. I think that really stands out for me. Yeah, well, I mean, because uh, you know this isn't a coherent plan, and it doesn't consider all sectors of the economy. It, it's a, it, it's not a clear roadmap, so it doesn't provide the uh, the kind of certainty to investors, nor does it provide the kind of detailed um, information that would enable us to make these assumptions about where the government of Alberta should actually invest. I mean, certainly there's uh, an important role for hydrogen among a suite of solutions, but even uh, even so, there are many other uh, um, technologies and other areas of, of the economy where there's substantial opportunities to, to, to make emissions reductions. There's very little in this plan around transportation, very little in this plan around buildings and efficiency, and, uh, you know, little uh, in terms of actual specifics about the how the Alberta government claims it will regulate the oil and gas sector. You know, some talk about the, uh, the emissions cap, but uh, clearly Alberta has the ability to enhance that cap and actually drive emission reductions down. But there seems to be, a, you know, conceding to voluntary action and waiting for industry to, to make investments. That's never enough to drive the kind of performance that we need to see. I, I find that the this government can't even get its numbers straight. I mean, it talks about how the current oil sands emissions are at 72 uh, megatons per year. Well, that was the 2017 numbers. Uh, I mean, I've interviewed at s and Global, which does very detailed modeling and analysis of oil sands uh, GHGs, and they they peg it at now it's in 2022 was 80 megatons a year, rising to 90 megatons a year by 2025. And if CCUS isn't built in a timely fashion, it could go well beyond 90 because the oil sands is expanding its uh, its output uh, in this decade. And so to talk yeah, about so. yeah emissions reduction. While the you know one of the biggest emitters is is increasing its uh, its emissions by you know ten or maybe fifteen megatons a year is is in their messaging completely bizarre. 
Yeah, you're right. 80 megatons is uh, close to the actual number. I think the only, I mean, perhaps they're using 70 because the specific rules about the oil and gas cap, I think, allowed some exemptions for how uh, upgrading and cogeneration were treated, perhaps. But you're right, it's closer to 80 megatons. And I guess this is the curious issue. Oil and gas emissions need to come down and they need to come down fast. And if the government of Alberta is not willing or able to regulate those emissions themselves, they appear to be conceding uh, regulation of those for the federal government. Now, I mean, obviously, we would we would love to see uh, um, the government of Alberta commit to, to regulating re regulate oil and gas emissions, but they're not doing so. And as a result, I think that's this is why the federal government are having to step in. Right. And we saw yesterday uh, one of Premier Smith's closest advisor, uh, uh, Rob uh, Anderson, uh, on Twitter, uh, you know, uh, ridiculing and mocking the federal oil and gas emissions cap and making it very clear that the government is opposed. Well, in fact, Premier Smith herself has said many times that she's opposed to it. It's one of the reasons she brought in the ill-conceived sovereignty act. I, I guess to, to wrap up this conversation, Simon, there's a lot more detail in this in this plan that we could go into. But why bother? There's nothing there. I mean, it's just literally the status quo extended off sometime in the future with a few, you know, little bit of window dressing around it to make it look like it might be sort of a climate plan. And this is very disappointing. And and the timing of it is very interesting. I mean, it's only a week or two until Premier Smith is expected to drop the writ on the Alberta election. Releasing it now almost guarantees that this will be a an election issue, uh, you know, and and it seems I don't know I I wouldn't want to go into an election campaign as the leader of a political party and defend defend this document. So anyway, Simon, thank you very much for your insights. Really appreciate this. Thanks very much, Malcolm.